So good afternoon. Welcome to the session named Advanced Applications 2. Uh, I'm your chair for this session. I'm from the Dutch NN Surfnet, um, where I'm a technical product manager, media, video, in the Advanced uh, Services Department. So um, that explains why they choose me to be your chair here. Um, in this session, we have three speakers. The first uh, speaker will be Axel Wagner uh, about his LifeWatch project. And the second speaker would be Bart van Horne about the sea level station monitoring facility. And the third speaker would be Dr. Cameron Kittel about CyberSca. And I would like to introduce now, to come up to the stage, um, Axel Parkney. He is from the Fraunhofer Institute for Intelligent Analysis and Information System in Germany. And he was um, um, uh, well uh, involved in the EU-founded EU preparatory phase of the LifeWatch project. And Kees Salat, he mentioned this project in his keynote yesterday. So it's good to know what is that all about. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I suppose it's a bit, bit exotic what I'm talking about here because the project is not as advanced. Uh, it's different to other t talks I've heard here because so far uh, talks were about systems which were running. Uh, this system is paperwork so far and the construction phase is just to start. Certainly it's, uh, I suppose, uh, exotic because uh, it's not about big data uh, but it's about many data, many data in, in very different formats. And certainly, I, I suppose, uh, though everybody knows the keyword biodiversity, few people really know what this is about. That's why I start to give a very little introduction to what biodiversity research is about. So, uh, the, the general idea is you have a piece of land, sea, whatever. Something, a patch on Earth, maybe a big patch, maybe a small patch. And then you ask questions. What lives in this patch? And what is already a difficult question? It's a taxonomic question. Give a name to it. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it, but the names of, uh, well, whatever lives, ranging from uh, humans to, let's say, even viruses are sometimes considered as living entities. I think 40% of the names change every year. Strange. So you have to find out what it is, and that's really a difficult issue. Second, you have to understand where and when. You have to count how many birds are in the air. That's one of the favorite sports, uh, watching birds. Uh, what kind of birds are where, but, but what, what kind of lichens are at the tree next to you? Tell me. Tell me the name of it. And how, how, how much? Then the really serious question is why, why do they live? What are the ecological conditions? Soil, climate, weather, whatever has an influence. Uh, even the humans have a big influence on that. And of course, it's, uh, they live together. So the interaction of what lives is very important. And thirdly, that's probably the political question we are most of the time interested in in the Red List. For how long is this going to keep up? Or what can we change in order to preserve? Okay, uh, an example, because I think that's qu quite exotic to talk about butterflies or whatever. A very good example is pollination. I think on the left hand side there's the oldest picture related to pollination. Uh, pollination is absolutely important. We can't live without pollination. You wouldn't believe it, but all the plants need pollination. And there are a couple of animals, like bees, all kinds of wild bees, which are responsible for pollination. And, as you see, this has an incredible economic impact because in the States bees are dying. So, the Netherlands and Germany and some other countries are nowadays the biggest exporters of bumblebees just to replace the bees in America. Uh, there's something like, which is called pollu uh, uh, pollination management in the States. Uh, consider the, the orange orchard in, uh, in, uh, San in the area of San Francisco. One orchard has about 50,000 beehives. This must be organized in order to pollinate the orange trees. 
And now they die, and we don't know why they die. And there are lots of reasons. Uh, the, the present belief is it's a fungus. But we don't know because we don't have all data. We have to relate a time series of what happened before to what's happening now in order to understand. And that's what biodiversity research is about, these kind of results. What is LifeWatch? Well, LifeWatch is an e-infrastructure which is going, supposed to support these kind of research. Uh, it's a lot of things involved, like uh, distributed observatories. Most of the things are, should be support, supposed to be distributed. It's distributed data processing, big data processing. Sometimes you have, though you have not, the size of data is not that big, usually. But uh, the problem is data is distributed. It's, it's in hundreds of institutions, and you have to get them. And, it's not, and there are in hundreds of different formats, and you have to gather these kind of data in order to compute something reasonable. Uh, well, the state is, I'm not anymore involved in LifeWatch. It's the preparatory for project, which uh, started three years ago, ended in January. And preparatory project is just the same as uh, the person about the Large Hadron Collider said, 10 years ago, they started to design the infrastructure. Yeah? We used three years to design not only the infrastructure, it's, it's, it's much more complex, because what's going to happen in the construction phase in which we are now is that a new kind of legal entity is to be created. It's called an ERIC, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, which is a totally new, new, new legal form, and we had to define this new, new legal form. Uh, the interesting big why, why we do this is you are uh, exempt from EAT, which is very good for research. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, we are in the construction phase. You see, uh, the idea of the construction phase, rough estimation, it's 300 something million AQ for five years. So we try to set up a lot of IT infrastructure. It's not only IT infrastructure, it's as well infrastructure about. Uh, getting access to, let's say, spacious records, which are museums, etc. Yeah, there are lots of people, you, you probably know these pressed grasses or whatever. Uh, they have huge collections of this, and they have to be photographed, uh, each photograph being, at, I think at the present, 280 megabyte. Yeah, so it costs, it costs uh, seven euro, that's what I've heard, and there are supposedly two billion of such exemplars to be to be uh, uh, foot, uh, copied. Right. Well, what shall the LifeWatch infrastructure be? be? That's, even that had to be defined. We had no idea what this is supposed to be. But it shall be an infrastructure consisting of many national and a couple of inherent LifeWatch nodes. It shall be it shall give access to data. And as I said, data are very, very distributed in very different formats. So the only help to access the data is going into standards. And whoever has been involved in this knowing that going into standards is awful. It takes ages till people adapt to it. But it's the only chance because data are so, so different, really. And we need them as well. That's quite interesting for grid purposes. We need them on quite small granularity. For instance, if you have a red-listed animal, you are not allowed to see the, the location where it lives, but you may see other data. So we were, even security authentication or so has to be very, very specific. It has to be related to sub-parts sub of, of documents or sub-parts of, of data sets. Yeah, shall be. It shall be combine a lot of different things. Uh, I won't go into this, what's involved. It's a gene analysis, it's ecology, more or less everything in, is in it, so that's why data are so heterogeneous. Further, it should support the whole scientific life cycle. What does it mean? Well, you acquire data, you process data, you curate data, meaning uh, you preserve them for the future. And what's very important, what's one of the stress factors of, of uh, LifeWatch, actually, we want to have it, is provenance. For the scientific procedure, it's very, very important, especially in biology, to exactly trace who did what in order to get the credits. Because usually it's very difficult to access data because people are not willing to give them away because it's their PhD or whatever. Yeah? If they don't get credits, it's, uh, it's difficult. Another thing about provenance is you want to 
uh, repeat uh, experiments. So biodiversity uh, science should become a science in a way that experiments like in physics should be repeatable. Yeah? It's not, it's not a possible so far. So you must know what kind of processes you have applied to what kind of data. You must make data persistent, because if you change data, the results will be different. And that may uh, result in quite bigger, uh, big data stores. Well, finally, and that's something which we had here, uh, we want to have something like uh, collaboration uh, over the world, uh, having setting up something which we call a virtual laboratory, it's like a real laboratory, people are in it, they discuss uh, an experiment, they change experiments, they change parameters and so on. And of course they get uh, access to very specific data only according to authentication rights or whatsoever. Uh, I think I don't say anything about uh, authentication authorization, so maybe it's it's a good idea that I, to talk about it here. The idea is to use something like Chibules, federated identity, single sign-on. Because, that's another thing which we have to consider, uh, people in this business are biologists, are biodiversity researchers, they have very little idea about computers. The state of the art is usually that uh, you shift around Excel sheets or so. That's, yeah. Okay, challenges, that's almost the final part already. We have to deal with five challenges. Uh, one of it is heterogeneity. Uh, I talked about this quite, quite a bit already. Uh, then it's a gap between the current practice and what we want to achieve. Then it's scale. Uh, we want to have well, quite, quite big contributors, many, many nodes. Uh, relating to it, and probably many, many users, hopefully many, many users at some point. Uh, finally, of course, if you design a system like this, uh, you have to consider that technology is changing. Even the three years we considered this uh, paperwork, I think technology changed and we always made new assumptions. So yeah, in a way you have to guarantee that uh, what you're doing is sort of persistent for some time. Uh, finally, uh, well, you have to fit it into, well, well, oh, what's else, girl, yeah, okay, you have to fit it into industry practice. I won't talk about this, I will on, only talk about certain aspects of, of, of this. Heterogeneity, well, just look at the slides. Uh, there are a lot of names you don't know about. Uh, I didn't beforehand as well. Now I know the names. I don't know what's behind the names, really. Uh, this has to be combined to make meaningful results. So what's the uh, solution to that? Very conventional uh, SOA, service-oriented architecture. We just try to encapsulate everything as services. And you see a couple of service types here, which stand for a, a set of services which may be behind it. A particular point is that we have to incorporate, of course, all the existing software. So we have to adapt it in some way, which is not clear how to do it, really. Another solution to heterogeneity is semantics. And I give an example how this may look like. It's not how we plan it, but how it may look like. If you look at medicine, there's something which is called the Unified Medical Language in the States. And they have a lot of, well, call it ontologies, th namespaces for computer scientists. They have a lot of namespaces, and of course, and within the namespaces, you may have the same thing under different IDs. So the question is how to combine this? Well, the idea is you have a unified language which have mechanisms to combine this, different ideas, so that you have a similarity list or whatever. And the second idea in this medical list is that you have two kinds of levels, uh, a lower level where you have the real names and a sort of abstract level where, where you have few concepts like a doctor cures, cures a, 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 a illness, yeah? and you try to map illnesses and doctors and whatever, how he cures to, to this three-point uh, relation. Okay, uh, and of course, 
This is going to be used, these kind of namespaces, ontologies are going to be used to find data, first of all, to find services which operate on the data, and to make the different services interoperable. Next challenge, uh, yeah, it's the gap between the, the, the present uh, old behavior or present behavior and what we expect. A little bit like biodiversity research is like this thing on the left hand, this piece on the left hand side. It's paperwork. P people write, people send mails, etc. Of course, emails nowadays, but, but, but still it's uh, not really uh, supported by computer. What we, well, what would be a paradigm how to bring things to people, to bring to these kind of researches? And the idea is that of workflows. Uh, scientific workflows have been, uh, I think in a recent talk I saw my experiment, so there are even discussion uh, for about workflows, and these kind of workflow ideas suppose we try to bring to, to the biodiversity people. And so workflow systems uh, will be the essence of how people should arrange their services in the service-oriented architecture. Next challenge, yeah, the pace of innovation. Yeah, in the present, in the well, past phase of the preliminary project, it was difficult to see the woods for the trees. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really you. We made status report of what technology is available, about 200, 400 pages, uh, more or less, uh, just to understand what could be used and what is reasonable. And the other thing is now construction starts. Oh, this is an old slide. Two years ago, the construction. Yeah. Well, um, construction starts, but we have defined how to do the construction two years ago or one year ago. Technology is at a pace which is incredible nowadays. Yeah, just I'm now in data mining and I just try to use GPUs for data mining, and, and uh, it's incredible how it how it proceeds. Two years ago or three years ago, nobody talked about uh, GPUs in this area. Uh, so how how to how to solve this? Well, the solution is, I think, standards, standards, standards. Yeah, again, a difficult difficult thing. We. We have written a reference, so-called reference manual, reference model, in which we try to use as many standards as possible. Yeah? This covers the, well, the enterprise model, the business model, so to speak. This covers information models, which may be used, service models, engineering parts, and technology parts. The technology parts, of course, the weakest because it's just a, a time uh, a snapshot of the present of the present technology and, and a little bit of what might be the case. Yeah, but the most relevant part of it is the design, the design procedure, namely try to, classical software engineering, try to make an abstract model first, yeah, UML or whatever, then go to a more concrete model and then implement it concretely on a, on a service platform. A service platform means really decide what kind of languages you use, XML 1.1, uh, WWSL 2.0, or whatever. Yeah? Because if, and that's well, not a slide in between, uh, that's a bit just to illustrate how these information models, what, what are the part of the information model, we have meta schemes, uh, concrete schemes, etc., etc. A lot of other things are as well in the, we have a service model, we have um, implementation rules, that's the most important bit. That's, uh, I think 100 pages of implementation rules. Do you know about Inspire? Uh, anyone who knows about Inspire? Okay, Inspire is uh, a directive of uh, the EC about ge geospatial coding. And there are lots of services which are very relevant to our our business, because more or less all the data are geospatially located, it's a, it's a directive which says you must present the data in this standard form. Yeah? Uh, and you must implement services in this and this and that way. And we try to adhere to it. Why all this business? That's the paperwork we've done. Why all this? Yeah. Well, we have not one developer. We have Many, many, many developers. This has to do with the financing model. Because the financing model is the following. 
this, the members of the ERIC I talked about earlier are states, European states. They should give money according to the gross, gross national in income. The problem being, they don't give the money necessarily in cash, but also in kind. So the in cash money will only be 15% probably, just to get the organization going. The rest will be in kind, means local development. And now imagine you have, I think, 20 countries, or how many, hopefully will, will contribute at some point. You have 20 countries. In each country, you have 10, 20, 30 institutions, and they provide you services and software. How is this going to work? Yeah? That's why we need extremely well standardized procedures. And of course, the other bit is we don't have only one data provider. I've heard here about tera petabytes, okay, but petabytes of the same. Yeah? We, do, we probably have mega, giga, probably a bit more bytes, but all very, very different. Yeah? And all of these data providers have to be accommodated, which is an incredible business. It takes ages. And we have lots, these are the services which are going to be contract, constructed. Lots of, lots and lots of those. Yeah? So you see, there is a problem here. We try to solve this problem with a quite a rigid software engineering and design procedure, which hopefully works. We have a construction plan, how things are sequentially constructed because you can't construct everything at the same time. Uh, most importantly, is most important thing is data discovery, service discovery, data access, service access. But uh, other things are going to come. And that's it. Almost the final, that's the goal, to build a proper house with all kinds of things which are needed involved. Catalogs, services, a portal, a single portal is uh, the idea, of course, is a lot of things to do, to do a lot of things in single portal, to do it web-based, because that's how people work nowadays. You have security, I talked about authentication and uh, authorization, that is uh, of the way, maybe a very, very fine granularity. Uh, yeah, you have virtual organizations, somewhat up in the clouds yet, uh, and you have to incorporate all what is available by now. And that's it, and the documents are accessible from this site. That's it. Thank you, Axel. Um, do we have any questions about the live project? Yes, wait for the mic, please. Well, it's just a bit of a, a bug. Have you heard about GMS? The project that the people of GM3 are doing? Yeah. Okay, they, I've been asked to give you a commercial about that because you said that th several magical words, li words like uh, the uh, composable services and the uh, ontologies and those yeah. things. So some people are very interested in talking with, yeah. uh, with yeah, you about fine. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. As I said, I'm not any more involved in this, but you should address, uh, go to Alex Hartis here and can give you the email address. He's, okay. he's now more or less a technical manager of LiveWatch. Okay. Yeah? We try to talk to industry as much as possible, to IBM, Oracle, or whatever. No, the, this is the community. Yeah, yeah. Talking as about. well to communities. Yeah? Okay, yes, the Terena people and the NREN people. My, my personal, personal judgment is that uh, even if a lot of money will be spent, if it's going to be spent, uh, this will carry, carry on only if it's community-based, because the researcher themselves must be involved, otherwise it won't work. Yeah? But on the other hand, since, since really the, the problems of data access are so complicated, uh, one, need, one needs a little bit of infrastructure and upfront in order to get things going. That's very important. On the algorithmic side, I don't see that much of a problem. You can contribute everywhere uh, easily. But uh, on this infrastructural side, it's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. A question here?
Thank you. How successful has been the abstracting away the functionality and throughout the, the, the life cycle so far? And uh, can you comment on how that's uh, bumps, you know, kudos, darts, I, that kind of stuff? No, no way to comment because we they just start to construct. I don't know. Okay. And it's it's really well. The point is why why did we take take up a lot of these things. Uh, we used the reference model of uh, uh, a best, best uh, practice example of OGC. And OGC, Open Geospatial Consortium, so far is the most successful uh, consortium in standardizing things. It's all the industry uh, subsumes to, to these kind of standards in, in the geospatial area. So we took up this, this reference model. They had a reference model as well. We enlarged this reference model somewhat yeah, uh, because it has been successfully used already. Mm -hmm. So it's, we don't do it up for, uh, in a way just on paper, but we tried very carefully to see what people have done. And this seemed to be one of the very few successful examples. Can you comment about um thoughts around operational team to support this? The, what? An, uh, is there a, a dedicated operational team for the support? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. There will be, this is, a, that's uh, being paid by the in cash money. There is an mm. operation. Now they set up, I think, an operational team of six or seven persons already. Okay, that's what mm. I was looking for, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. this yeah. sort of size. No, we have, I think, I think that, uh, well, I, I should have said something about this, right? Uh, the, the, the kernel of LifeWatch will be an operational team which tries to see that people conform to the standards we set. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Be because if you, if you don't control, it doesn't work. Yeah? Right. So you get accepted, your services get accepted if, it, if they pass certain tests. Yeah? And do the participants, uh, over time, will they have us, is it a service model or the contributions in kind over time are, are great? Uh, but what happens, you know, year three, year four, et cetera, those kinds of, have those been thought out or are some uh, comments? The, the idea is to continue developing the procedures all the time, but uh, from experience, software engineering experience, this will be a hard job, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. But it must be, because otherwise I think it, it's not going to work. Personally, again, I would argue that the best thing would be if the core structure would be set up by industry. Mm -hmm. But since, yeah, big company, yeah, which, but uh, since uh, it's a bit against the open source, it should be open source, but it, the I think the beginning should be done by a big company, but that's the question of this in-kind, uh, in-cash problem. Mm -hmm. If there's a lot in cash, quite clearly uh, one would like to use big companies. They have much more experience than, than groups of researchers in doing such systems. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you again. A uh, very big challenge, and we'll know in five years, I guess, when this is successful or not. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. And then I would like to introduce the next speaker, which is Bart van Horne. Uh, Bart is from the Flanders Marine Institute in Belgium. And his main focus has been the development of taxonomic uh, or biological databases. And uh, he has been involved in uh, the sea level station monitoring facility since 2007. His presentation is about this facility. And examine the performance and delay of 430 tsunami warning stations. With the March tsunami in Japan still fresh in our mind, this is a very highly uh, um, um, relevant subject. Okay. Thank you. Um, maybe to start off, um, a, a short introduction about what is a, a, um, a tsunami warning station. Um, in general, uh, um, a sea level station can, can serve for two things. Um, it, it just measures continuously the water level. It's also call, called a tide gauge. Um, the, the, um, the measurement of the water level is always compared to a reference level, to a benchmark. So whenever someone installs a, a tide gauge, there is always a fixed place on Earth that where the um, station reference, references to. Um, a sea level station could be on land or uh, could be a buoy. Uh, 
Um, usually, uh, all the stations have solar power and uh, are independent of any uh, electricity or anything else because most of the, those stations are far away from uh, cities or uh, anything that has uh, electricity. Usually, um, uh, a sea level station or a tight gauge uh, has one or more sensors. Um, there's a few common sensors. Um, there's uh, the oldest one, which is a mechanical thing, uh, which, which is called a floating sensor, a float sensor, and it's basically just a, a floating device that goes up when the water level goes up and goes down when the water level goes down. So, and it just measures um, the difference, very easy. Then we have a rudder, a rudder sensor, which is uh, acoustic. It's just the, the principle is also easy. It sends a beam down to the water level. The beam get, gets back to the sensor, and it measures the time. And by doing that, you can um, measure um, the water height. There's also a, a pressure sensor, which uh, is just using a normal uh, air pressure. And there are also... Uh, maybe uh, four or five other types, but they are not uh, commonly used. Um, maybe to have, a look, uh, how, to have a look how they look like. This is a very old one. So at the left, you see at lo the, st the situation at low tide, and at the right, you see the situation at high tide. So and measuring the water level is just done by uh, um, the meter at, at the left. Um, this is a, a, a very a newer station. This is um, one that is using the, uh, an acoustic sensor. So um, it, it, this, the sensor is just on top of the water, and whenever it goes up or down, it me measures the difference. You can also see the power panel on top. Same again, uh, power, uh, solar power panel. And uh, the sensor is probably in the, in the house, in the sea level station itself. Um, this is an example of a buoy. There are about 50 buoys around the world uh, which are measuring um, sea level. And sea level uh, speci specifically for tsunamis. There are a lot of other buoys but they are not measuring sea level. So w what is the purpose of those um, tight gauges? There's uh, twofold. Um, the first purpose is, of course, as I've been mentioning, tsunamis. But for that, the data needs to be real-time. So you want the data to, to arrive in, in anywhere in the world within a second or something like that. A second um, purpose of a tight gauge um, is a delayed mode um, system. Um, the, the, the data can arrive uh, somewhere in the world, but it doesn't matter when it arrives. It can be uh, within a day, within a year, within 10 years, but you still have the data. So the, the, the point is you, can, you, you need that data um, to calculate the um, sea level rise over time. So we have the data from 1800 onwards, and an extra, an extra thing on that, uh, on that kind of data is there has to be some quality control of the, of the data. Um, for the real-time data, you cannot do any quali uh, quality control. Uh, well, you ca can do some quality control, automatic quality control, but uh, not human quality control. So for the delay mode, you can do quality, tr quality control, so that takes some time uh, to propagate the data. Um, there are some problems um, for the real-time data. Um, the sea level station, they can predict in some way tsunamis, but what happens whenever you have a storm surge? Whenever you, a storm surge is whenever there's a lot of wind over the seas, so the sea level will go up and it will stay up. So, and then um, you may think that the there is a tsunami on its way or something, but that's not true. So that, that's a possible issue. Also, another issue for the real-time data is usually um, it's already too late when you see a tsunami on a, on a tide gauge because the tide gauge is on land. So whenever the tsunami arrives there, it's already too late. So 
you, you have to combine uh, a few um, things so you can calculate things based on uh, earthquakes um, and you have to use boys or uh, something else. Um, for the delay mode um, data, there was also an issue. Um, whenever there is an, an earthquake or something, yeah, whenever there is an earthquake, you can have a vertical landmass movement. So the land can go up and there could be less water on, in the water column. So this would, this would, would indicate that there, there is a, um, a sea level a difference in sea level, but that's not true because the, the land has just moved up or down. Um, this is the example from uh, the last tsunami in uh, Japan. You can see this is a station which is about 100 kilometers away, away from, the, from the epicentrum. So you see at uh, 6 o'clock that um, there is a difference of uh, four meter in uh, water uh, water level, but you see it it, it tops it tops out, so uh, it, the, the sensor is probably just broken or something. <laughs> um, this is a station a bit further away, and you see also a difference in uh, two meters difference. This is actually not the wave height, of course. This is just an this is an averaged value, so. Whenever they, they tell you on the news it's, it's a wave of 20 meters, that's, that could be true, but we will never see actually 20 meters on those uh, tight gauges because they are just averaged out. Uh, a little bit more away, still um, 0.8 difference. Uh, and this is in Hawaii, so the, the, the earthquake uh, was... Um, was clearly visible all over the uh, ocean. Um, okay, um, now those those tight gauges are are, are grouped or are, are managed in, uh, in in a certain way. So there are many networks that have tidal gauges. Usually, they are grouped by a country, by a region, or even on global level. U usually, it's a it's it's a, a local a, a local thing. So by country. On the right-hand side, you see all the stations from uh, the U.S. Um, all those, um, all those group, all those networks, of course, have their own standards and use their own own systems and use their own uh, methods of transferring. So this is a problem for integrating all those uh, data. So and that's what is what we have try we have been trying to do up till now. So, of course, it's a problem for interoperability. So, again, it would be good if we could, if we could come to one standard. And um, so that would make the, the system better, of course. Um, the second example, this is the UK network. Um, so, how is the data retrieved from those sea level stations? Uh, the oldest method is, of course, just go to the station and transcribe it. Okay, nobody is using that anymore, but it used to be like that. Uh, for example, for the, for the data from 1800 onwards, it was like that. Uh, nowadays, everything is digital, of course, but still we have stations that are not connected to the internet or to, to anything else. So you actually have to go to the station, fetch the data, copy the data on anything, uh, USB stick or whatever, and bring it to your uh, institution. Um, nowadays, most of, most of the data goes wireless or wired, so that can be anything, GPRS, uh, satellite, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi Max. Um, um, when, whenever it's wired, you can use just uh, the internet, just an, an ISP or a, um, anything else that you can use a dial-up line, a leased line, etc. So anything that you can, anything that that you can connect will be used. Um, for the delay mode, it does not matter what you use. Uh, any of those four, even transcribing, will work because you have to do the to the quality control of the data, uh, and you have to do to do some calculations on that to to 
to calculate the um, sea level rise over time. But for the real-time data, there are, we use three methods at the moment. Um, there is the GTS, which will ex all, oh, I will explain all those three later. So there's GTS, Bigon, be uh, Internet. So Internet, yeah, as I said, it could be anything. It's, uh, it's an FTP server, an HTTP server, an email server. Uh, it could be dial-up, it could be a lease line, whatever. Uh, the GTS system. Uh, the GTS system stands for Global Telecommunication System. It's, it's managed by the World Meteorological Organization, and it is defined as the coordinated global system of telecommunication facilities and arrangements for the rapid collection, exchange, and distribution of, of observations and processed information within the framework of World Weather Watch. So the system was already there before there were any tsunami warning systems in place or something. So we just took over that, used that system for um, transferring um, the messages. It is an integrated network of point-to-point -point circuits and multi-point circuits within interconnected meteorological telecommunication centers. So basically, every country has a met, met office or a meteorological office that uh, predicts the weather. So all those have access to it. This is the, tr the structure it's, uh, of the GTS. It's kind of, it's a bit complicated, but okay, it doesn't really matter. It's a hierarchical system. You have three uh, main telecommunication networks, which are in Melbourne, Moscow, and Washington. So geographically very dispersed. That's intentionally done, of course. Then you have the regional uh, meteorological um, networks. So those are 16 or 17 uh, regional, so divided by um, countries or, or larger entities like Europe or something like that. And on top of that, you have the, you have the national um, meteorological sensors. So that's, that's what you see on the outside of the, of, of the circle. So, and we as a user are, um, we as a user are here, so we are connected to our national um, meteorological center. So, and this system, this system is is the GTS. So, the GTS is 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 in fact a black box for us. So, it does not really matter how it works. It just works. All the data goes in and it comes out however we want. We don't have to care about uh, internal communication, um, communication problems, uh, routing, whatever. It just works for us. So as I said before, it's interconnected via landlines, it's via, via satellites, it's, uh, it's the principle of a network, so it has some failover, it has, it has redundancy, it, have, it has routing, it's very similar like the internet, but it's totally independent of the internet. Also, I, I've mentioned before, there's limited access, only the, met, the national meteor services get access. Of course, there are exceptions to that, like us, like we, we get access via the um, National Meteorological Center. But not everyone in the world can get access to the GTS. That's, of course, due to political reasons or whatever. But that, that, that's maybe a disadvantage from, from the GTS system. The GTS um, allows both upload and uh, download of data. For example, we, of course, we download all the data that is avail available for all the stations, and we display them on our website, but we can also do upload if we want to. So, okay. A second uh, method of um, getting the data to, the, to, to us is, is something, something new we have been testing from in the last uh, two or three years. Uh, it's called BIGAN. BIGAN stands for Bro Broadband Global Area Network. So it's basically a satellite dish which connects to a satellite from Immersat. Um, it's very cheap, well, the, the infrastructure is very cheap. It's the size of a laptop, and you can just put it next to the station and it works. Also, an advantage is, well, could be disadvantages also, but it has a, it has a public internet IP address. So, you, you, in fact, you can connect to the station directly via the satellite. So there's no GTS in between, there's, no, there's nothing else in between. So, at the moment, we are doing tests for... Um, I think about uh, eight stations at the moment around the world 
which has those which have those began installed, um, they are sending the data to us via uh, HTTP POST request. Um, the third option of transferring the data to uh, to us is via the internet. Um, so this could be uh, anything a broadband connection. Uh, um, just uh, via an ISP or something else. Um, there are three methods within that. Uh, usually, if you get data, you, you do it via an FTP server. Um, it's, uh, it's a flow of data, so um, the, the, gauge puts the, the tight gauge puts the data on an FTP server. It could be locally, or it could be within our uh, FTP server. Some stations, I think it's only three or four stations, um, send their data through email, but that's really not reliable, so we, we want to get rid of that. And then another method is HTTP, so uh, that could be a web service. Um, so all the stations from uh, NOAA, you have seen the, the network from, um, from the United States, all those stations provide their data to us via web service, which is called OpenDAP, it's some kind of, t it's, a, it's a standard. SOAP is also another standard, standard. The German tight networks uh, sends uh, their data to us via um, a SOAP um, web service. Another possibility is just to scrape an HTML page because um, in some countries people really don't want to um, build something new, a web service or uh, an FTP uh, connection or whatever. So, but they have th their data on their own website. So what we do is just scrape that HTML and uh, transfer it to us. This is how the website looks like. Um, so whenever you go to the page, uh, you see the status of all the gauges we are uh, measuring at the moment. It's, uh, there's no count on it, but it's around 400 or 500 stations. So all those which are in um, green are okay. So uh, we are getting the data, we are getting the data on time. Um, the station is working. All those which are in red means usually either the gauge is down or we don't get the data in time. Um, the second part of the website is a, is an, is a list overview of the stations, so uh, you can basically sort on anything, so you can see um, the name of, of the gauge, the country, um, the method of how it, come, how, how it arrives at our, our site, so FTP, GTS, BGAN, and all those others. So you see the delay. Uh, also, you see the delay color code. Whenever it's red, it means it's bad. Whenever it's green, it's 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 not too bad, but it's it's uh, not good either. Whenever it's uh, um, whenever it's uh, dark, it means it's it's just uh, probably down. So here you can compare and you can see all the, st all, all the gauges uh, in the list, which is very good for an overview, of course, except uh, besides the map, of course. Um, when you click on one of those stations, you see all the metadata from the station and you see actually the, the, the tight graph you, you, you have seen uh, before. So this station has two, um, you can, it's hard to see, but it has two uh, different uh, sensors. It has a pressure sensor and it, have a, it has a, a radar sensor. So the two are, are on top of each other, so which, which means it is good. Both sensors are measuring the same tide. So whenever you have two sensors, it's, it's useful, of course. Whenever one sensor would, would be doing something awkward or uh, measuring the wrong tide, you would see that on the graph. But here you can see it's exactly the same, which is, is good. Um, also, um, there, is a there is a possibility to edit the metadata, so the gauge operators, the tight gauge operators can edit the metadata, the metadata and uh, they can, can change it whenever they need to. There's also a web service that people could use to read in the tight gauges from our, web web from our website. This could be useful for people who do not have access to the GTS, for example. Um, so, how is the actual transfer from um, the tight gauge to, to the website 
uh, how, how, how does it work? So um, the, first, the first step is it, uh, the tight is measured at the tight gauge. Uh, it goes to, for, we are talking about the GTS system at the moment. So um, the tide is measured at the tide gauge. It goes to a satellite. This could be either a satellite which is part of the GTS, but it could also be a satellite which is not part of the, G the GTS and sends it to, to, to the GTS. So I said before, GTS is the black box. It doesn't matter, it just works. <laughs> Um, the, the data within the GTS is routed to our national Belgian Met Office, which is KME. Um, then KME um, starts up a script and sends the data to our FTP server, and it does that every minute. Um, then again, every minute, we have our own batch script which, which reads in the FTP data. And it, it reads the, uh, the FTP data and it, transfer it transfers it to the database and it displays it on the website. The icon is gone, but okay. Um, oh, it's okay. The performance uh, from the GTS um, stations, the, the transmit interval from the GTS is one, one time per five minutes. Um, it's very difficult to increase this because it costs money. It's, it, uh, the GTS works with time slots, so uh, there's a limit of one message per five minutes. Of course, in, within those five minutes, you have five minutes of the previous data. So usually the, the, the tsunami uh, stations have a five minutes transfer, uh, transmit interval could also be 15 minutes. Uh, it all depends how it is arranged. The median delay from the GTS gauges is 11 minutes. So this could be better, of course, but we have to look in that how to, how to solve this. So it, ideally, that would be it would be five minutes, of course, because then you have a, in fact you have zero delay because um, the ratio we, we also called we also we also calculate calculate a ratio which is the expected number of messages we, that, that should be arriving uh, divided by the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the messages that has be really been arrived. So as you can see, um, this is all, uh, where is it? This is all close to 100%, so we don't lose any messages or, or, or anything, and which means the GTS, the GTS system is really, uh, Reliable. Um, how does it work from the tight gauge to, to the website via the internet? So um, it's comparable to the previous one, um, but instead f of going to a satellite, um, it goes directly to the internet uh, via any, any means. It goes again to our FTP server and the, the batch script reads the FTP. See the difference um, the, uh, from the GTS, the, 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 the data was read once per minute, and this is only done once per five minutes, because if you are reading 200 stations and you have 50 or uh, 60 different uh, FTP servers that you are reading in, it takes some time to read all of those. So. Uh, this, is, this, this takes some time to, to, to execute the script, so it, it takes almost five minutes to execute. So you could not go, go any far, further than this. Uh, again, the same database and website. Um, the performance uh, of those um, stations is um, not that good because a lot of communication errors happen, of course, on HTTP, FTP, uh, email, or whatever. Uh, servers are down, servers go up, uh, an FTP server, you can, the, the password has changed, all those things. So uh, that makes you lose a lot of messages and you see the percentage is, uh, is, low, is, is much lower than 100% for most of them. Um, the median delay is also not that bad. Um, it's 11 to 12 minutes. 
But the ratio, of course, is bad because you, you lose a lot of messages. Um, from the tight gauge to the BGAN system, uh, from the tight gauge to the website again, but via the BGAN, so this is really the ideal system, I think. So from the tight gauge, you go directly to a satellite. That satellite is directly connected on the internet, and that the, the tight gauge itself, in fact, uh, triggers the script which does the insert into the database, So, which means you have zero delay. So. We are testing this now, and it looks like it's working. So uh, we will continue doing the testing and uh, see how it goes. Uh, the performance of the BGUN, very quickly. Uh, you don't have a batch script which, which runs every minute or every five minutes. The delay is zero or, or maybe one minute. Okay. Um, a disadvantage is the terminal only sends one time per five minutes. If you could do this, if you could uh, change this to one time per minute or something, it would be even better. But the problem is those transmissions, again, cost money, so people prefer to do only one transmission each five minutes. Um, yeah, and we have to work on that one. So the ratio, again, is, is not too bad, 100% for most of them. Um, conclusions, GTS uh, transmissions are reliable, very reliable. Um, which is a positive point, of course. The negative point is um, the transmissions. It's hard to change the transmission interval for than, uh, less than five, one time per five minutes. So one time per minute or something is difficult because, again, of the political reasons, uh, money, uh, everything you can imagine. Uh, also, a negative thing is uh, not everyone has access to the, to the system. Um, the Internet... Is not reliable. Well, the internet itself maybe is reliable, but the, the service, services which are running on the internet are not reliable. They go down, they go up all the time. You have timeout problems, whatever. Um, a few, a few of the internet gauges. There is a, an advantage, of course, that you can. The internet is in principle free, so you can change it to one time per 15 seconds or something. So this is really fast data. Another uh, advantage is the ease of use, and it's very easy accessible. The BGUN, which is uh, the most re reliable, I think, or, or e e uh, even reliable as the GTS, um, it is fast. And the advantage is you have zero delay because um, the, the insert into the database and the display on the website is triggered by uh, the, the tight gauge itself and not by a batch script. The, the disadvantage is that the, the transmission cost for the B gun is uh, expensive again. So going below five minutes is again hard to do. Okay, that was it. Thank you, uh, maybe one question for Bart about this work. Uh, <laughs> so again, we're lying because you've grabbed the attention of researchers in my university. Actually, they are wa watching the stream, and they have been reviewing what you have published because they are working heavily on tsunami simulation. Mm -hmm. So they have asked me to relay you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. May I? Uh, one. Big one. <laughs> okay. Yes. I'll do it. Well, it's. First thing, they say that uh, the Pacific Tsunami Warning System, it's mentioned in your website, but then you do not uh, show the data from the boys that use the DART system, yes. the D-A-R-T. That's right. Why? Uh, because we have to add it. <laughs> okay. That was easy. So, most of the boys that you are uh, monitoring are floating boys or pressure boys in the uh, in well that is already answered you are using the no boys no boys the the uh, monitoring system in in the in the shore so that's it that's why your two questions <laughs> thank you <laughs> you can always ask bart later sure. of course uh, roland do you have one last question uh, yeah i was just wondering you you have these three systems which um, I mean, apart from the internet one, they use satellites. Um, 
I suppose that's because all the uh, monitoring stations are very remote. Yep. But yep. Uh, do you also have you also considered using stuff like uh, GSM or GPRS because though some, that's available at many locations. Some stations, even. some stations are using that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, but you list that as internet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it, you know, wireless. Again, thank you, Bart. Then it's my pleasure to introduce uh, for the next uh, session uh, Dr. Cameron Kiddel. Um, he is a research fellow of the GRID Research Center in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Calgary, Canada. And he's the technical coordinator of the CyberSCA project. So Cameron will tell you all about the Square Kilometer Array, about radio astronomy, social networking, and then my battery is dead. Okay. Uh, cloud computing and, uh, and cyber infrastructure. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm going to be talking about CyberSK today, and the title says the universe of data on your desktop. I don't know if that's really correct. It should be more accessing a university of data from, from your desktop, certainly not having it on the desktop. Um, so... I'm basically going to go over first uh, our, our sponsoring organization that's funding the project right now, which is Canary, tell a bit about them and the different pro programs that they are doing, and then I'm going to give an overview of Cyber SKA, where this you know fits into the context of Square Kilometer Array, why we're doing what we're doing, the architectures, what we've done so far, and where we're going next. <coughs> so... Canary is the National Research and Education Network for Canada, and that is the organization that is funding our research. And so, essentially, most of Canary's funding goes towards, you know, improving the network, uh, improving the effectiveness for researchers within Canada, getting them access to the network, uh, supporting the different provincial or regional networks within the country, and also providing funding programs to enable researchers to get better access to the network and better enable their research. So <clears throat> the one program that uh, CyberSK is being funded under is the Network Enabled Platforms Program. And so this is focused on really enabling domain-specific areas to get better access to computing and data, essentially creating middleware portals and so forth to do that. And so there's 20... NEP projects being funded by Canary in Canada from a variety of domains, health sciences, transportation, high energy phys physics, so the, the groups in Canada that are working with the LCG, ocean science, space science, uh, the cyber SKs within the realm of radio astronomy. I'm also on some other projects, uh, one Geochronos, which is an earth observation science, and also a green IT project called the Green Star Network, where we're exploring follow the sun, follow the wind type uh, computing environments. So Cyber SK itself is basically a project where we're exploring the cyber infrastructure, middleware, services, etc., to support current and future radio telescopes such as the Square Kilometer Array. <laughs> and particularly from the perspective of users getting access to data and to processing and to being able to collaborate with each other. <clears throat> so the, the Square Kilometer Array itself, it's not uh, built yet. It's in the preparatory phase right now of design and figuring out ways to go forward. And there's various different Pathfinder projects and Pathfinder telescopes around right now. So there's ASCAP in uh, Australia, Meerkat, South Africa. We saw a presentation earlier this afternoon on LOFAR. Uh, so there's a variety of, of projects ongoing right now to kind of explore and, and start getting in this larger data space. And within several years, it'll be within the kind of SKA-1 phase, which will be more a 10% uh, scale of the SKA. And by in the 2020s, sometime in there, you'll have a full SKA that will either be built in South Africa or Australia. I believe the decision is to be made next year. So what are the kinds of things that are being discussed or planned to be explored by SK? So this will become the world's you know, largest radio telescope that will be able to take a, you know, astronomers further back than any other radio telescope into the history of the universe. And so looking at the origins of the universe, origins of different objects, 
uh, origins of galaxy, uh, you know, also looking for sources where, you know, life might exist elsewhere in the universe. So some example radio imaging survey rates and uh, data and where that's going. So currently uh, in the area right here is kind of where we are now. So Galfax is one such survey collecting data off of the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, uh, EVLA deep field, uh, that's a, an array in uh, New Mexico. Meerkat is the uh, South African uh, telescope that they're building right now. Possum would be a survey that will be conducted on the ASCAP South uh, or the Australian. So data rates are continually uh, rising. Once it gets to the SK, we're going to be dealing with phenomenal data rates that are going to be uh, very big to deal with. So the motivation behind Cyber SK then is to achieve these SK science goals. They're going to be done by survey projects of large collaborative teams from around the world. They're going to have very high data rates and data volumes, and they're going to have multi-purpose complex processing needs. And so this drives the need for cyber infrastructure that's going to enable the scientists to collaborate with each other, to get access to data storage and management services, and also processing, analysis, and visualization services. <clears throat> so in Cyber SK, we're basically looking at developing an initial prototype uh, platform to help meet the evolving needs of, of really current and, and future radio telescopes, not necessarily specific to the SKA. This particular project is, is being led by the University of Calgary with several North American partners and certainly looking for collaborations among the international community as well. Uh, as I mentioned, Canary is our sponsor within Canada for this. And really, we're starting with some SKA Pathfinder projects or surveys, such as Galfax and P Alpha, which are collecting data off of the Arecibo Observatory, also from EVLA, ASCAP, as I have mentioned as well. So such a platform, what, what it's going to need? It's going to need to be distributed, distributed resources, distributed data needs to be scalable to adjust to adapting and increasing data needs, particularly deployable so that you have, you know, new sites can easily come on and add and contribute their resources. It needs to be heterogeneous to provide access to different computing resources, different applications, different services that are going to be doing different processing, getting access to different types of data, and so forth. Automated need to be automated for the user so it's simple and straightforward. All of the different technical tasks are carried out automatically and seamlessly for them behind the scenes. Transparent, particularly a focus on making it very simple and easy for the user to use, where they have web-enabled access to get access to all of the computing infrastructure, to get access to data, to get access to collaborating with each other without you know, needing to be in the location without needing to know the technical details of how things are taking place. So as I mentioned, we want to be able to have a collaborative environment where these different research teams from around the world will be able to interact with each other. And we need interactive services to be able to automatic and visualize data online over the internet and be able to track where provenance, where data has come, what's happened to it, where is it going and be interoperable with different standards, such as the virtual observatory standards. So in terms of a context, so you have a variety of sites that could be scattered around the world, and you have different data sources coming from the telescopes uh, or other data providers that are providing information. You have different web services, different uh, third-party application services, data processing services available to users via the site. And then in terms of the context of who would this site be for, well, of course, it's going to be for domain scientists, the astronomers to be able to access data, collaborate with each other, but also applicable to the engineers, the technical people involved, the software developers to interact and develop on their end, eventually and ultimately, you know, students, educators, general public, uh, for them to be involved, learn more information, or even, you know, citizen science to be involved in, you know, things like Galaxy Zoo, or... So from a high-level architecture point of view, the users have contact through the system through a collaborative portal. 
So a scientific gateway to all of these different sites and services that are available. At a given site, you have a, a variety of services that might be available. You might have very you know, specialized HPC uh, computing resources for carrying out different processing. You might have different cloud computing resources to be, that might be handling or carrying out or, or hosting different third-party application services, interactive visualization or different batch processing and data management services. So depending on the needs, different sites can offer different services and there's some flexibility there. So in terms of currently within CyberSK, so it's a collaboration of several institutions within North America. And so we're setting up on, at several universities within Canada and also Cornell in the, in the States. So some processing and storage capacity at uh, some of these and uh, you know storage capacity at some more and of course you know building this on top and making use of the canary network as well as uh, the Cornell I believe is peered through the lambda rail network in the United States so the solutions that we've developed so far so in terms of the collaborative portal we built a portal at uh, www.cybersk.org and essentially, it's a portal that's built on top of a open source social networking platform called ELG. Now this provides all of the common Facebook-like features, such as wikis, uh, document media sharing, messaging, discussion forums, blogs, microblogs, <coughs> activity feeds following what other people are doing. And so if we, we take a look at you know, very popular social networks out there like Facebook, well, Facebook has been very successful on, on a phenomenal level. And it's really changed the way things are done. And if you look, they have over 30 billion pieces of content that are uploaded a month. So, I mean, they deal with a large amount of data. They have over 500,000 third-party applications available for users to use. So it's a very successful platform that enables quick communication and collaboration among people, is providing access to large amounts of data and providing access to a large amount of services and so we're modeling very much the environment after uh, that type of environment. So in terms of some of those data solutions that we've done so far, so we have some of the Galfax data that has been processed so it's been significantly reduced from off of the observatory I believe a given run is uh, comes shipped on uh, a disk about 50 terabytes worth of data for a given observation run. And then that gets reduced down to about 300 gigabytes worth of a, an image cube. But still for users to work with that or download that, still 300 gigabytes is a large amount of data. And so there's an interface on site to interact with that data to select particular region of interest, to average over given channels, select the different uh, parameters for that image that you might want, then that gets submitted off to a, a virtualized condor pool uh, in the cloud that will then process and uh, subset that data and make it available at a much reduced size for you to download and make use of. Another aspect within in the data is the establishing the distributed data management system. So we're building this on top of IRODs the integrated rule-oriented data system. So what IRODS provides is basically abstracts the location of the data away from you. You basically just have a, a virtual file handle to your file. It keeps track of where things are, has efficient mechanisms for moving and uh, transferring data between sites. And so essentially right now we have that running at two of the sites and we'll be expanding to the other sites as well. Uh, we make use of a a Postgres uh, database for the image metadata that's adherent with some of the virtual observatory standards and also supports uh, spatial, temporal, and spectral queries over the region. So the notion of being able to query a given region, get the data there, and then also feeding this into workflow processes that can mosaic that data together, uh, compress, stage the images, and so forth, and make them available to the user. And also looking to add much other functionality, Fourier analysis, other analysis uh, functionality that people might want to have as part of those workflows. <clears throat> so visualization on the front here too is once again the key thing is about making this easy and accessible to the user from wherever they may be uh, with whatever device they may have so long as they have a web browser 
and internet access. And so the capability of being able to visualize and look at that data without having to download the entire image is of importance. And so we have developed an online uh, FITS tool. So FITS is a popular uh, file format used for many of these images. And it supports interactive panning and zooming. Uh, you can do different histogram correction to you know, display the brightness. And you can adjust the color maps. You can do some analysis, some statistical analysis, some 2D Gaussian fitting. You can share the exact view that you have by sharing a permalink with others so that they can go and view exactly what you had been viewing. You can take screenshots and upload them to the sites as well. And so essentially, any of these files that get integrated with the CyberSK site are accessible and viewable via this online tool. So currently, it is, is more client-side based. And we're currently working on a server-side version that will just specifically send out the proper resolution to the browser and frame and, and make it much more of a uh, movie player type environment to quickly go through different images and have all of the processing and generation of those images handled on the server side. <clears throat> so another key aspect of the platform is a third party application API. So much like a Facebook API where different people can come in and integrate their applications with the platform is an API then for other people to come and integrate their applications with this platform so that people can come to CyberSK, have a variety of applications of access to them, get single sign-on to those applications, and we're making use of OAuth to do that. And so they come, certain applications are available to certain users. You can set the controls. People come in, get access to this wide variety of services that can be hosted elsewhere, and enable, I guess, much easier integration of different tools and services that people have developed. And so currently, we have over 140 members from around the world that are working on various SK Pathfinder projects. So in particular, you have various different groups. So groups is kind of the main you know, collaboration feature on the site. Uh, members can come on, establish groups, and then collaborate within those groups, form subgroups within there to work on specific projects within that. And so we have like the Galifax, P Alpha, EVLA, Deep Field, uh, GMRT, different surveys associated with that. We have groups associated around different software, such as CASA, um, MechTrees, other different software that's in the use for people to discuss and make use of that software, or, or other just different groups based on just different collaborations that are taking place. And so in terms of the next steps of where we're trying to go, so currently we're in the process of setting up the cloud computing infrastructure at these different sites across Canada to make it so that handling these different workflow processes, uh, launching visualization servers, uh, handling the ingestion of data and extraction of metadata, so that all of this can be done in a uh, seamless and transparent manner at different resources. On collaboration, we're continually customizing, adding new cus uh, functionality and features, trying to integrate with different tools to provide a better collaborative environment for users. Uh, data management, we're going to be working on expanding that to the different sites and really working on a, a tighter integration between the services within the site and that data management system and making that available to other third-party applications as well. The data visualization, as I mentioned, we're working on expanding that to a server-side based tool <clears throat> and, and hopefully we'll have uh, demonstrations ready for that at the SKA 2011 uh, conference which is coming up in July. Data processing, really then within this cloud infrastructure or even within access to other high-performance computing resources, establishing the batch processing and interactive environments to handle the different types of workloads, and really to enable users to come and integrate their code or different types of services, whether that be through coming and creating custom virtual machines with their software on, or just coming up and uploading different Python scripts or so forth that they might want to work with the data. So really creating a user-driven community, not only by the content that is supplied, but also the software, the services, and the tools that are available, making a user-driven round. Uh, the applications itself, so right now, the third-party application, we just really handle the single sign-on aspect. We're starting to get some of the data uh, management 
calls into that third-party API, so it's just a RESTful API that applications can interact with. And so the intent that these different applications will be able to pull and push data, much like third-party apps with Facebook, whether you're pushing different news feeds or even pushing data to the site, pulling data from the site to these services, or pulling information on the user's contacts and collaborations to you know, better make use of the community and the services and what is available on the site. So that is what I have for you today. Uh, the site is available at cybersk.org. I guess uh, we have some couple of minutes for questions. No questions? I have only one. Where do you store okay. all that data? Where do we store all the data? So like I say, we're establishing a distributed data management system. I mean, we're, we're not at point looking of handling the petabytes and exabytes of, of data that yes. the SK is going to be handling. And, and, and really, you have to look at it from being, there's going to be many stages involvement. There's obviously the raw data coming off, the telescopes that will go through correlation and through you know, severe data reduction processes right on site. There will be other processing that gets done probably at different locations to further reduce that. And then other data that scientists are working with and sharing. And so, I mean, right now we're looking more from the user perspective, getting them access to data that might be at different sites, being enabled them to process and work with data from those sites and then get their reduced data sets and work and share with those data sets online. And so with the distributed data management platform, you can easily add new sites, new data storage amounts, you know, quite easily uh, that way. Yeah. Makes sense. Any more questions? No? OK, thanks again. OK. And then I like to address some announcements about um, Please to take a moment to fill in the, the online evaluation form for this session and for the conference in general. And of course, uh, this uh, tonight, the gala dinner um, and at the reception of this uh, venue, we will leave at uh, 1845 to go to take you to the trams. There will be three trams leaving at seven, uh, quarter past seven and half past uh, seven and they will take you to the, to the venue in the old tram. And on the way back, there will be buses um, from 11 till midnight to take you back. Okay, hope to see you tonight and have a good, uh, good night. Thank you.